Currently sitting in the seat that ordinarily would be occupied by Steve McDonald, who runs our Africa program. But Steve was called over to the State Department on an emergency basis, and he said, gee, would I mind introducing TechnoServe and the uh, Coalition to Fight Poverty and Hunger in Africa and uh, a really important program? And I said, I would be delighted. In many ways, my own program looks at globalization and what it can mean for everybody, and this fits very nicely into that kind of thinking, too. Well, for those of you that are new to the Wilson Center, let me just say a word about our own history. We were established in 1968 by the Congress that was looking for a way to honor President Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president. They decided against another marble statue or monument and instead created this living memorial. And the, the mission that they gave the center was to capture both sides of Wilson's life. Wilson, as you may know, was the only president who earned a PhD. And in his era was quite a prominent political scientist before going on to be president of Princeton, governor of New Jersey, and then a two-term president. So what the Congress asked us to do was to bring together, in a sense, as I said, both sides of Wilson's life, the people who were doing the best thinking on public policy, together the people who were making, influencing, or implementing that policy. And that's very much what we're trying to do here today. And I, I do want to recognize the two organizations that have done so much to put this together. I know TechnoServe really took the lead in, in bringing us together today. Uh, TechnoServe is quite an impressive organization. They have worked, I think, in some 30 countries. They really provide exactly what their name suggests, which is the technical advice, but in the context of working very much with the private sector. They look for entrepreneurs. They try to foster entrepreneurs that can together really attack uh, these problems. Um, they, uh, you'll hear today about what they've done to help revitalize the poultry industry in Mozambique. And uh, that really initiative led to uh, the, the work to build networks of women-owned grain mills that were able to help develop uh, fortified products and poultry products. Our other partner today is another old friend, Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. And this is an alliance, again, of experts here, African experts, U.S. experts, experts from other donor countries that really work with to forge partnerships with government, private sector, civil society, again with that focus on fighting poverty and hunger in Africa. Again, a very impressive organization. And it is my added pleasure to introduce Julie Howard, who's the executive director in that partnership. Julie's an old friend of the center. It's great to see her here again. Uh, you have her bio, so I'm going to be overly brief, but she is not only the executive director of the partnership, but she's worked in half a dozen African countries, including some work in Mozambique. She is a PhD. She is a much published author, making her a very Wilsonian kind of character, writing on the one hand and doing on the other. She uh, will take the lead from here on and introduce the rest of the panel. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is this on? You can hear it? Okay, great. Well, Kent, thank you very much for that, that very nice introduction. And I liked everything except, I think you said old friend and old a couple of times. And so I'm feeling a little I, I should have corrected that Julie and I were in <laughs> kindergarten together. And it <laughs> so, well, thank you. Um, thanks to you, Kent, and to Justine and, and her team for welcoming um, this event to the Woodrow Wilson Center. And it is true, we are old friends, and, and, and we try and collaborate on a number of activities through the year. We find it um, wonderful, really, to be at the Wilson Center because we always get a, a diverse mix of, of folks, and that always leads to a, a good discussion of our topics. So thanks to that. And thanks, Susan, um, basically, for, for doing all of the legwork, I think, to put this, this wonderful panel together. Um, and I've got the wonderful um, job today of moderating the, the first panel of this discussion, which is called market-led strategies for improving the accessibility and affordability of poultry and fortified foods, cases from Mozambique. But I just wanted to say a couple of words in introduction to this topic um, and say from the partnership's perspective why, why this is such an important time for all of us who 
care about this, this confluence of, of agriculture, food security, nutrition, and private sector. Um, I think it's really no um, exaggeration to say that um, we're seeing a real sea change right now. We've seen a sea change after decades, literally decades, of U.S. disinvestment from agriculture and food security in developing countries and nutrition. Um, really, we're seeing a turnaround to that. Um, we've seen a turnaround with, in both the administration and Congress. So it's sort of doubly significant to have everyone sort of turn around and say this is a key area for, for the U.S. and for its partners in civil society and private sector um, to invest in again. So we're excited about that. Um, I think the partnership would love to take credit for this, but I think the actual um, event that, that really spurred this change was the 2008 food price crisis, um, which really elevated agriculture food security to a matter of national security for the U.S. as we saw a number of governments uh, topple around the world and sort of the, the hint of instability that could come if we don't address this very real challenge that we have in front of us of effectively doubling um, food production over the next 50 years. Um, but it's more than food security. Um, I think what we would like to take away from this in the partnership is investing in agriculture is not just about giving people something to eat every day um, or helping them to grow what they need. Agriculture really is um, Growth in agriculture is one of the most highly effective ways to reduce poverty that we know of. Um, we have many, many studies around the world at this point that say, okay, if you have three quarters of your population living and working in agriculture in rural areas, the most effective way of, of lifting their incomes is basically making agriculture more productive. Um, a recent study that was released, 43 countries, shows that gross domestic product growth from agriculture benefits the income of the poor two to four times more than GDP growth in non-agriculture sectors. So it's not just about feeding people, it's about lifting people out of poverty. Now, three things I think that are different about our, this new focus um, on agriculture, food security, nutrition. It all revolves around what's the best way to achieve this, this agriculture growth that, that we know is important. We're thinking about things differently. Now, first, a new commitment to respond to, to country-determined priorities. Um, we hear that very strongly in the commitment from, from the administration on this. Um, and, and those of you, many of you I know have worked in the field before, you know what a challenge it is. And in our partners, I see some of our, some of our partners from the, the embassies, the African embassies here. It's a real challenge when you have dozens of donors, each of them with tens of projects. How do you administer those? How do you make time to meet with all those people? How do you group those into, into priorities? So I think we have a new realization that the countries really need to set the agenda, not just the governments, but also in collaboration with civil society and, and private sector. And that's very important and that's very different. And, and we in the partnership, frankly, are looking to this as a model for um, broader reform of U.S. foreign assistance. The second thing that I think is very relevant to today's discussion is a new appreciation for the central role of the private sector in all of this. And I know the partnership works very closely with our, our African embassy colleagues, and they are always coming to us and saying, what can we do to get more private sector um, interested in investing in our country? What, what do we need to do? What, and that's been a difficult conversation to get started here in Washington. But I think with this initiative and this energy, um, we are getting to that point. So, and, and our, our partners, TechnoServe, really have been at the forefront for the past, gosh, is it 40 years? 42? Wow. <laughs> okay, let's leave it at forefront. <laughs> um, TechnoServe really has been at, at the forefront of figuring out what does it take to bring in foreign direct investment and what does it take to nurture um, private sector development in this area in agriculture in developing countries. So, so it's going to be wonderful to hear Jake, who's one of the, um, I won't say old, you know, experienced. <laughs> Please, yeah, experienced. Old, no problem. Right. So we in Africa, have, that's a compliment. Okay, MZ. Okay. So TechnoServe has been at the forefront and now we have public attention to this area. And, and Susan and I have been talking quite a lot over the past um, past weeks, and you know we're not hearing this evolving the, the place of private sector, the importance of this investment, the importance to economic um, growth, and we're 
searching for ways ourselves of, of, of making this a more public accessible story and not just one that's that's hidden in the pages of annual reports um, from NGOs or from the private sector so love to hear your thoughts on that as time goes on um, the final point I want to make is and again this is very relevant to Mozambique it's not just about economic growth it's not just about incomes it's not just about agriculture it's also about very much about nutrition um, and we and the partnership and other, other groups here are very glad to hear the connection made between agriculture and nutrition. Uh, Jake, I know you remember um, the, the furor that erupted in Mozambique in the 90s. Um, we, we saw very rapid growth in agriculture in, in Mozambique. You know, the economy is growing great guns, and all of a sudden people looked at the poverty indices and the malnutrition indices and saw them sort of skyrocketing and saying, hey, what's going on here? You know, we've got the cotton sector, other sectors are really going great guns, and we've got children growing ever more malnourished. So I think it's really important that we see in this initiative uh, from the administration and from Congress across the agencies a renewed um, commitment to these things must move in tandem. And you, you're even starting to hear more and more talk about this child malnourishment as being a fundamental indicator of whether we're succeeding um, in these initiatives or not across agencies. So I think um, I will be quiet and turn this over now to our, our panelists. And I think what we'll do here is we'll, you guys will talk 10 to 12 minutes each, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. We'll ha hopefully we'll have a number of really good questions, and we hope that we've left enough time um, to consider all of this. So Jake, um, you are the Mozambique Country Director, TechnoServe, and you all have in front of you, I think, a copy of Jake's um, impressive bio. So Jake, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Julie and the Wilson Center and the partnership uh, for inviting me here. Um, I first uh, met Julie, we just went, remembered, uh, well, I should, uh, maybe I shouldn't say what it is, <laughs> in 97. Uh, at that time, I was uh, a business guy. I had just joined TechnoServe and just moved to Mozambique. And I'm not sure that she trusted me, being a business guy. Um, but I'm glad to say after 13 years, um, she trusts me enough now to invite me to talk to you all. So I'm, at least that's an achievement. Um, the, as Kent said, one of the things we do well is uh, identify entrepreneurs. And an example of that is the lady up here in the pink uh, blouse. Um, behind her is a woman uh, and her daughter uh, who are pounding maize and uh, civ yeah, civ civing maize. I guess you would call it, um, and and that's their probably their primary activity, other than growing the maize, um, in, in their in their daily life, and in that and, and probably getting water and, and firewood. Uh, so so pounding maize, growing maize, uh, eating maize, uh, sieving, you know, getting it ready to preparing it, is how they spend most of their time, and it's what they primarily eat. Um, that's about all they eat. Uh, maybe some greens, you know, maybe some peanuts, uh, but very little else. So maize is at the, at the center of their diet, and it's also at the center of their work life. The, the woman in front is an entrepreneur who has an idea, and I'll talk to you a little bit later about that. But her idea, and what she's already done, in fact, is to start a maize mill, um, which will provide milling service to these, these ladies so that they don't have to do all that work themselves. Um, and uh, they can do other things with their time. Um, and what we're going to talk to you about more a little bit later is the other things that this woman, this entrepreneurial woman, could be doing that deal with issues about nutrition, um, uh, incomes, uh, and other things that are important to this, this family. So um, that's just a, an introduction of where we're going. But that's, the, that's who our target here is in terms of using a business approach uh, to addressing nutrition at the family level uh, in Mozambique. The, our, our thinking on this really emerged uh, before the kind of, uh, I think, change here in Washington. It was about five or six years ago. Uh, we had done a lot of work in what's called value chain development, but we realized that um, it's more than just money, uh, as Julie said. Uh, there, there are quality of life issues. There are nutrition issues. As Julie said, people were making more money but not eating better. There were a lot of challenges at the family level uh, that needed to be addressed. And, and our question was, how could we do this still in a business way? So I think what we just started doing was take the, taking this more multifaceted approach, creating partnerships, 
recognizing that food is a system. There's many different aspects to it. I'll talk about that a little bit later. A more holistic understanding and to, to measure our success more broadly. In fact, in our most recent project that we're starting now, we're going to be asking much more questions about are you happier, basically? You know, are you more content with this? I think it's something called the personal wellness index. Um, you know, so we're, it's important to measure nutrition. It's important to measure numbers. Uh, but there's other things going on in people's lives that are important to address. Um, and we still think we can do that in a business approach, which I think is what's interesting about this. So first I'll start with the poultry industry. Um, we developed and implemented a vision together with the government of Mozambique, the poultry industry, and global corporations. The poultry industry was really struggling five years ago in Mozambique. They had about 25% of the market, 75% of the poultry was, was uh, imported, um, and it was getting smaller and smaller. They were losing money. They were fighting among themselves. Uh, it was not a very good situation. Um, we developed this vision. Um, we understood that we could go grow grain competitively in Mozambique, particularly in the north. Uh, we were already exporting maize to Malawi at that time. Um, and that's the foundation for a strong poultry industry. But there were a lot of things that needed to be done um, to get the poultry industry going again. Uh, we had to increase its competitiveness. We did that through capacity building, training of companies, um, uh, helping them in numerous ways with, with how they did their business. Um, and then also small-scale producers, because it turns out that broiler raising can be done by families. And in fact, in the southern United States, in Brazil, in Thailand, the major competitive countries of the world, it is done by families on a larger scale than Mozambique, but we will get there in Mozambique. But we recognize that family production could be competitive. Um, it was also at the time of uh, avian flu, shortly after we started this program, it was important to mitigate disease uh, and also food safety. Um, was an important issue. Um, and then finally, uh, we had to have a better environment. When we did our study, what we determined was that a lot of the problem the Mozambique industry faced was that the chicken wasn't coming from Brazil, it was coming from Dubai. Uh, it had been there a year, it was past its sell-by sell date. Uh, there, was, there was no, uh, they were meeting no requirements in terms of food safety uh, for the, the food to come into, the, the chicken to come into the country, and it ended up being very cheap as a result. Um, now there's a level playing field in Mozambique, and that's what we convinced the Mozambican government that they needed to do, was to create a level playing field so the domestic industry could know who they were competing against. They were competing against Brazil, not against uh, you know, an old chicken from Dubai. Um, so you can see the kind of partnership that was developed. It was Technoserve. Uh, Cargill had a lot of expertise in this area. Uh, they were working with SAFE, which is an industry association of animal uh, producing animal products all, all the way from McDonald's to uh, Cargill and others uh, that are involved in the international trade of, um, of animal products. And their insight was that every country in the world had to have better veterinary services, had to raise the standard of health for its animals for trade to be able to take place globally. And so they partnered with us to help us with best practice in terms of uh, what we were doing with animal health in Mozambique. And then finally, on the, the government is the one with the little um, the sickle and the AK-47. That goes back to Mozambique's fight for independence. Um, but that's the government of Mozambique. And then uh, the association, this is the Poultry Association on the right, we created in the course of this, pro um, um, this program uh, because, again, they were fighting with each other. We had to tell them they needed to work together, that their enemy was actually uh, Dubai, <laughs> or Dubai and Brazil, uh, but it was not each other, um, and, they, and they figured that out, and then we helped them uh, create a very strong association, which I'll tell you about a little bit more. The, uh, the, the core, one of the core parts of this program was a national advertising campaign that really emphasized the, uh, how poultry, how domestic poultry was particularly fresh, flavorful, and healthy. Um, and, and it was to educate consumers about that. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the lady that we created. She's called Ama Frango. Um, AMA was the association's name, but Ama also means love. It means mother. It means uh, your, your daycare worker. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's all those sort of uh, affectionate things. Uh, and here she is speaking to the press in her uh, little apron, telling people about, you know, how it's fresh, flavorful, healthy, and it's really very nice. Uh, that's what that, maninge nice mesmo is what that means at the bottom. Um, 
and this was an extensive campaign, uh, and uh, it was in all the local languages. It was in many different ways. We had little coloring books that were handed out at restaurants and at uh, stores uh, that went to kids. Uh, kids sing the music. Unfortunately, I didn't get the music for you today, but there's jingles that have been developed uh, around this. And uh, you know, kids put it on their cell phones. They uh, sing it back and forth to another, each other. And they tell their mothers and their fathers and so on to buy you know, Mozambican chickens. And uh, the result of that has been, if you look at the next page, uh, a, a real sea change, really, in the poultry industry. Consumption has increased at 20% per year of poultry in Mozambique, which is that's a lot, I think, in, in, any, in any market with any product. Um, and the, the domestic share, if you look at the, the bottom, was, like I said, about 25%. Production is the, on 2005, production would be the small little box and uh, consumption the, the big blue one. Uh, but if you go to the top, to 2009, now you can see that over 75% of the chicken uh, is produced in Mozambique, um, and it's a lot more chicken. People are eating a lot more chicken. So this is a success story <laughs> for an industry, uh, especially one that was against the ropes. Um, and the result of that, if you look at the next page, is really the benefits have gone to the people. The president of Mozambique made a, a speech up in the north um, a couple weeks ago, and he was commenting on the economic development of the north in general, and he said, and one of the really big industries that a lot of you don't know about that's grown a lot is the poultry industry. And the reason you don't know about it, he said, is because it's spread out. You know, it's a lot of small people producing chickens uh, on a much larger scale than they have in the past. Um, and and it's, it's obvious when he goes around and, and, and visits families in the north, uh, he can see this kind of development, um, these kind of ladies uh, growing chickens. You can see three, old, three ladies and then uh, one with her daughter and I guess probably two grandchildren. Um, and these people have received, in addition to training on how to grow, you know, world class, they may not look world class, but believe me, the genetics and the feed, um, the vaccines, uh, the training that they're getting is world class. Um, the, the, in addition to that, they're being trained how to use their, their own, the money that they're going to earn for improved nutrition, uh, to, to improve, you know, to think ahead about where that income is going to go. Um, so it's life skills as well as production skills. And the companies that have done the training, all of this training has been done through the private sector. Speaking of partnerships, we didn't have, TechnoServe didn't have a single person actually doing the training. It was all done through the companies providing the chicks and the feed and so on so that it would be sustainable. So all of these families are now sort of, you know, approved or contracted uh, producers for poultry companies for the long term, and, and it's something that we don't have to be involved in anymore at this point. And then finally, the consumers I put in the, in the bottom corner there in Nampula, the north, this is Christmas time in Nampula, a hot day, hot night, uh, and uh, they're grilling chicken on the grill. Um, the chicken was just flying out of the supermarkets and uh, flying out of every corner that you could see around Christmas time uh, this last Christmas in Nampula. And, and instead of that chicken coming from Dubai, it was coming uh, from these ladies here. Um, so what this led us to in terms of our understanding was that, that about this being a system is we also s began to think about maize and food in general, you know, and what's the relationship between the poultry sector and the maize sector. And as you can see, 55% of the, the, the volume of uh, feed, which is what goes, which is 70% of the value of a chicken, um, is maize. It's about 50-50 in value. The soybean is worth more on a per kilo basis. Uh, but maize is the core of it. And so we started to, looking a little more carefully at the maize industry in general and trying to understand it. Here, if you look at this chart, what you'll see is that uh, we, we looked at the number of business startups in Nampula province in the last five years. So the business type with the most at 110 is maize milling. Very interesting, I think. So clearly you have a lot of entrepreneurs that are moving into this, you know, small-scale entrepreneurs. The cashew factories that are at the 13, we, what we also were very involved in that, and they are the largest employer uh, in the region. Uh, but the largest number of businesses is the maize mill. And we think the maize mill is the business point, the point of leverage, you might say, uh, for where 
for, for how to address the nutrition issue uh, for Mozambicans, uh, at least maybe in other countries as well, but certainly in Mozambique, this is the place to address the issue. One of the reasons that we think so is that the people that go and visit the maize mills are those women, the women that I showed you on the first page, the two in the back that are pounding the maize. They're the ones that go three to four times a week with the maize that they've produced. They're, they take some of it from their store, they, from, their, from their storage at, at, at the farm. They bring it in, they get it uh, milled, and then they take it back home. So this is the business that women visit the most in Mozambique. It's the one that the average woman has the most contact with is a maize mill. Um, it's simple, as you can see. It's not a complicated business, uh, but it has, it's very, very powerful uh, in terms of substituting that pounding that you saw on the first page with this simple mechanical uh, milling that's going on here. And because of this, um, well, anyway, and so what are the things that this maize mill could do in addition to milling maize? Um, our belief is that in terms of the farming system, Probably at some point they may be able to provide inputs and extension, um, uh, and to some extent they're providing market access uh, because they can buy maize if the if the families have two you know more maize than they need for themselves. But most importantly, we think it's in storage and in milling itself, okay, and in adding uh, nutritional uh, fortification to uh, the maize that they're milling. And storage is really important. It's important for health. Uh, it's also important for the amount of maize. A lot of maize gets thrown out in Mozambique because it spoils, okay? Um, just by storing alone good storage, they can increase maybe 20 to 25 percent the amount of maize that they have in a, in a full year. Furthermore, it can be sold at any time in the year. Now, the companies won't buy it in the beginning because it, they know that it's being stored badly, so they're not going to buy it later on. Um, and Mozambique has the second highest rate of liver cancer in the world. And one of the reasons is because they also have a problem with storage of uh, peanuts, and groundnuts are a major part of their diet as well as maize, but it's also maize. There are large amounts of aflatoxin in maize that is uh, spoiled. So this is a clearly a, a food safety problem, uh, it's a nutrition problem, uh, and it's an income problem that can be solved with storage solutions at the level of the maize mills. And in the mills, as I said, we can do fortification, uh, and we can also produce chicken feed. So that's our link with what I was talking about in the early part of the program. Am I over my 12 minutes? One minute, One minute left. Okay. So uh, entrepreneurs like uh, Fatima are the right way to do this, we think. She took the initiative herself in this case. Um, you know, she's got her maize mill. She started just having a small um, uh, sales place in, in Nampula City. She made money at that. And she used that then to buy a maize mill and start a maize mill business. There are thousands of women like her, okay, that have small trading businesses but haven't got into maize milling and some of the other more advanced businesses that I've been talking about, like storage and so on, and fortification. So this is our vision now. We're recruiting partners. Um, we've been talking to DSM, who you'll be hearing from later. We've been talking to other people that can provide nutrition uh, and help us develop a package, almost like a franchise, you might say, a package of services and goods that women like Fatima uh, can provide to the thousands of other women that are already their customers coming to buy um, the service of, of maize milling. Uh, the other company here is the Export Trading Group. They've already agreed to help us. They're the largest uh, uh, trading company like a Cargill or a Bungie uh, within um, East Africa. Uh, they, they have a turnover of about $500 million a year, um, and they have a very supportive um, team in Mozambique that, that we work with very closely. So, um, you know, we, we have the ability to transfer the skills in these two areas of nutritional products and storage uh, that we think these women need. So the key to sustainability, what has made this a success? Uh, a holistic approach, market-led, competitiveness-driven, but focused on meeting broader consumer needs. Women at the center in this case, we think women are the ones that determine nutrition and we think we can make it a business. Um, and we think we can make them the owners of the business. Exit strategy, uh, just like we did with poultry, we will build it from the initial program, from the start, uh, and we'll have an industry working group, industry development group organized around maize milling, uh, you know, that, that these women will be behind like they were behind the poultry industry. 
Uh, we will leverage resources of the private sector on, to make sure that we're competitive um, and we're using best in class. Um, and again, it's, it's about the building, um, enabling local capacity. And most importantly, my last slide, uh, it's about leadership. Um, these are the leaders of the poultry industry in Mozambique. Um, it wasn't by design, uh, but it turns out that they're women. Um, and uh, the woman on the left is our TechnoServe advisor that did all the training of smallholders, the programs that, that were then given to the private sector. She's a veterinarian. Uh, the next woman over is the president of AMA, the association, which includes all the feed mills, all of the, the – um, she herself is the uh, general manager of one of the hatcheries. Um, all the feed mills, all the abattoirs, all the smallholder growers. The next woman over – uh, is the president of the Smallholder Growers Association, which is part of the larger association that the second uh, woman uh, is the president of. And the woman on the right is with the government. Uh, she's the assistant uh, chief veterinarian. Uh, but in addition, the chief veterinarian of the government is also a woman. I didn't have a picture of her otherwise, so I would have put her. Um, but uh, but, but this, is, this, is a, this is an industry that is led by women. Um, and we expect the same thing to happen in the maize milling industry. And these are really important. Uh, and, and they were the ones that developed these programs uh, tailored to women, designed for women, both as consumers uh, and as um, uh, producers and as business owners. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks for that fascinating story, Jake. And I know there will be many questions um, at the close of the uh, the presentations, but now I wanted to turn to uh, to Ron Krushorn, who's the director of Food Assistance Division in the Office of Capacity Building and Development in the Foreign Agricultural Service of, of USDA. And I just want to say uh, the partnership has, has worked m many um, sessions, um, many years. I have a board members, uh, ex USDA FAS director Ann Tutwiler is an ex um, board member of the partnership. She's the food security coordinator. So. I want to say one of the, again, one of the exciting things about the, the new energy uh, on food security is the prospect for many agencies being able to play a role in food security. So USDA continuing its strong role um, in coordination with USAID, OPIC, um, TVA, many of the other agencies. Um, so Ron, um, USDA was at the heart of this story in Mozambique, and we're looking forward to your comments. Um, about how that came to be and, and perhaps some discussion about what you see rolling out in the future. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> it's always dangerous predicting the future. But uh, Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, I just want to take just a couple of minutes, uh, a few minutes, to just respond a little bit to the presentation. Um, <clears throat> let me start, first of all, by by just noting that uh, this particular project was uh, funded from USDA's Food for Progress program. It's, it's a program that has about $200 million available each year, depending on prices and so forth. Um, and we use it to support agricultural development in probably about 10, to, about 10 countries each year. Um, the program usually does uh, involve monetization of the commodities. Um, so it's the proceeds are generated and, and the funds can be used to fund these types of programs. Uh, over the past few years, we've had a number of, of projects that, that we have funded um, that have been implemented by TechnoServe. Um, two of the countries where we've worked most often have been Honduras and Mozambique. Uh, I think we actually started this initiative with, with TechnoServe back in 2006. And altogether for Mozambique, um, USDA has, has invested about $12 million worth of, of taxpayer money into the two grants. Um, my office manages both the McGovern Dole program as well as Food for Progress, and we're also implementing the pilot program for local and regional procurement for USDA. Um, so in, in my chair, I, I get to see from a from a higher level a little bit, of, um, a lot of the projects that take place. Um, a few years ago, I was more down into the weeds, and, and I, I really knew what was going on more. Now I don't know quite as much, but there's certain information that kind of filters its way up. 
And on this particular project for Mozambique, I've, I've heard from three or four people, um, our attache who visited over there, and all of them had very complimentary things to say about the approach that was taken. And I know when Jake started, he, he was calling himself a, a business guy, uh, doing it in a business way. A lot of times as a donor, when I, when I s hear somebody who's into something for a profit, I go, well, you know, what's, what's their motive here? But actually for TechnoServe, <clears throat> one of the things that I've seen is, is that they do in fact try to identify and focus on some demand driver that's going to be there for a longer term. We hear and we throw out the words sustainability a lot. Um, we hear things about tying into the private sector. We hear things about focusing on the for-profit sector. Um, we hear about the need to establish long-term demand. Those are very easy phrases to throw out, but making them operational <clears throat> is one of the things that that uh, myself as a donor, I, I see it as a challenge, and I realize how hard it is. And uh, we all want to get to that point, but getting there is, is challenging. Um, and I think the, <clears throat> the realization is, is that for, for these types of projects to really work long term, um, you do have to address a number of challenges and a number of problems along the value chain. <clears throat> but you've got to try to identify, identify that long-term demand that's going to keep the project going. Uh, just as a, a kind of a final note, within, you know, within USDA, <clears throat> we face a number of difficult funding choices each and every year. For Food for Progress, we probably get 60 to 80 proposals each year, and we have funding to fund about 10. So getting down to that list and choosing among a number of very difficult, or choosing among a number of very good proposals is a real challenge. And we have a lot of discussions about how USDA should invest the funding that it has, um, whether it's value chains, whether it's trying to focus with governments on policy, uh, trying to do some type of investment funding or credit funding, those are all very difficult choices for us to make. And one of the things that, um, you know, I think we're, we're focusing more on more and more, again, is tying into that private sector, looking for that long-term demand that will keep these projects going. Because if there's one thing that we really want to have to come from our investment, and that is <clears throat> some type of initiative that maybe 20, 30 years from now is still operating and still helping that country uh, continue with its development. So I, I'll end my comments with that and leave time for more questions. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, I think we've got about 15 minutes uh, for your questions. And so, yes, I, I want to ask, Justine, do we have microphones? Okay. Um, when I call on you, and could you stand up and perhaps introduce yourself? Okay, please. So my name is Grace. I originally from China. I work for DSM, just newly moved to US. I'm very curious to hear regarding the Mozambique uh, business model. You mentioned the private sector, how important it is. And as a DSM, as a private uh, uh, sector, so we want to know what kind of successful story or learning experience after the private sector cooperation. Exactly what kind of business model from your experience it works better? Should we take a few questions? Sure. Okay. Why don't we take um, two or three others? Yes, Tony. Tony Carroll with Manchester Trade. Um, Jake, a terrific, innovative presentation, evidence of TechnoServe first sorting out what the private sector piece is and, and working from then on out. I'm um, just wondering, as a, a trade lawyer, uh, what were your 
persuasive arguments about the Mozambican government in restricting imports, and how enforceable are those, uh, you know, uh, provisions? Okay. Cindy? Hi, I'm Cindy Huang from the State Department's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative office. Um, thank you so much for all of these great ideas and what I'm sure will be an interesting discussion. And my question, as Julie pointed out at the beginning, is you know, we are trying to really make new efforts in a lot of fields like country leadership, integrating ag and nutrition, um, whole of government. And so one question is, and when talking about the private sector, how do we roll that up into a compelling story? Because there are so many great examples, and this is certainly one of them. And in thinking about developing our broader private sector strategy, what would you see as the main pillars? Okay, one more, and then we'll turn it over to you guys, and then hopefully have time for another round. Uh, Matthew Edwardson with the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, maybe just two questions. One would be, can you talk a little bit about the, I guess, the fees and the payments associated with the association membership and how you got that up and running? Were there kind of costs that were fronted into that? And then just kind of the buy-in of the government and kind of getting the government to think about this across other value chains as well within Mozambique. Okay, these are easy, you know, easily disposed of questions. So I'll turn to both of you, and then if you if you missed one, I'll remind you. Um, I, I think in terms of the business model, it, it really depends on the business. Um, you know, what's going to work for them? I think we we try to find win-win situations where it's of interest. Like I said, the. Um, the group that came in, both Cargill and, and SAFE, that provided technical assistance on animal health, had a broader agenda, which was to get all of Africa at a higher level of animal health. And they felt if they could take one example of Mozambique that was a relatively poor country and improve you know, the quality of veterinary services, that it would show that it would, this was an investment that could be made and was worth making more broadly throughout Africa. So they had an agenda of their own, and I think we just benefited, you know, we took advantage of that uh, for our own purposes. And I think that just comes from networking and, and understanding what businesses are looking for. I think in the case of DSM, I mean, we're just getting to know you. So, you know, wh whether the strategy is to, um, you know, develop markets for yourself or whether it's a, a corporate social responsibility strategy or whether it's some kind of a combination of those two, we need to understand that better and then mobilize your support, you know, to a project like this based on what your interests are or maybe not mobilize them if it turns out that, you know, there isn't a, a match. So I think it's a, it's a matchmaking kind of an exercise um, that, that is really unique to everybody. There's no one business model. Um, uh, and, you know, and I could go on with every business that we deal with. I, I think the incentives are different for all of them. So, so th that would be my answer there. Um, on restricting imports, um, we, we, we did a, a benchmarking globally in the poultry industry to see what everybody else was doing. And what we were looking at, looking for, was uh, what we were capable of doing technically, so we couldn't go to fancy testing. Um, but at the same time, we just wanted to make sure it was safe and was kind of, you know, not real old. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and then we also had to deal with the reality of the situation in Mozambique, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, we, what we did was we came up, we said, look, it's got to be no more than three months since it was frozen which gives the Brazilians lots of time to keep it in inventory, to get it out. It wasn't a restriction of trade. It was just saying by the time it gets here, it's still got nine more months of shelf life you know, to sell, so it's probably going to get sold and we're probably all right, instead of being a year old and not having any requirement, which we didn't have before. Uh, the second thing was it had to come from the country of origin. If the Brazilians produced it, let it come from Brazil, not from Dubai. You know, no, it could go transit, you know, somewhere else, but we didn't want it bumping around a lot of refrigerators that, you know, nobody had any control over, especially the Brazilians. And actually it was in their interest, the Brazilians, you know, to sell a better product, we thought. And, and, and I think in general they would agree with that. They weren't too happy about their product being dumped. Um, and then uh, the third thing was, the one thing that was maybe a little bit of restraint of trade was that we required a pre-shipment inspection, okay, uh, which is not something I would normally want. Uh, but the reason that we did that was that we knew that customs was getting a payoff as it was coming in illegally from Dubai. 
And, and that's really difficult to deal with. And we felt the best way to deal with it was that if SGS or one of the inspection agencies was doing the, the documentation in Brazil, it would be a lot more difficult for customs to get around it and fudge it and so on in Mozambique. And, and, in, and sure enough, after these, this went in and we convinced the government it was the right thing to do and they implemented it, um, the people that came in to complain were the importers and customs. So we were right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think, again, it's understanding, it, it's tr you know, we, we, we did not want to create a protectionist environment, and one of the reasons for that was that our analysis showed Mozambique could be competitive, okay? It did need to learn, it did need to get up to scale, it had a lot of, you know, infant industry issues, uh, but the long term, because we could produce grain competitively, meant zero minutes, okay, yeek. Okay, uh, okay but anyway, that's the answer there. Uh, oh, Cindy, boy, that's the hardest one. I'm sorry. Um, you know, wh what's the private sector strategy? Again, I think it's it's just being open to it and supporting it, and 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 you know, and like I said, you know, having the capacity to listen to what the private sector, what their motivations are, because I think they can be you know m multiple, uh, but you have to engage them and so on. I think the GDA is a good you know beginning. Um, and there's a lot of experience within USAID uh, that, that can be uh, benefited. But also, anytime you change a strategy, you've got to put money behind it, you know, even in private business. I, I've been in many companies where people say, you know, or even NGOs, you know, this is the new strategy, but if there's no money, it ain't going to happen, you know. So you've got to think about money. Um, association membership and cost, uh, yeah, we, we, we upfronted a lot of it. In the beginning, we paid for people to come to meetings. We, you know, pretty much we covered the whole thing. Uh, now they, they, they charge, and, and then there was a phase out, you know, and now they charge their own dues, um, and they have their own system that they developed, you know, for how to charge the dues based on the size of the business, blah, 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 blah. I think they could have done a better job on that, but anyway. Um, and then finally, what was the last question on government? Fees and payments, I think, is what I Oh, you asked one more question about government. How do you get the government engaged? Look, it's hard. Uh, you know, any time you deal with policy, um, there are competing interests. The importers have a lot of, imp a lot of influence. The largest importer of, frozen, of illegal frozen chicken, you know, after we changed the rules, uh, was the guy who just got named a drug kingpin by uh, Obama a couple weeks ago. Um, and, and, you know, he was importing, you know, he, he, he didn't have any rules. You know, he didn't have to follow any rules. Uh, and yet he was, you know, pouring money into the, you know, for Lima Party and, and, and so on. So uh, it was hard for the government to stand up to somebody like him. I'm kind of glad Obama did, you know. And the <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Now, do they recognize it? Um, yes and no. It, it, in the situation of government, it's always uh, some people do in the government and some people don't. Um, and, and you just have to find out who your friends are and, and work with them. Uh, I think at the highest level, at the presidency, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the president has seen the cashew industry become a success. He has seen the poultry industry become a success. He has seen the fruit industry that we've also been successful. So, you know, he does keep an eye out, and he's paying attention to what we're doing. You don't want to pull that card out every, you know, all the time. Uh, but I think it's there uh, if we need to. Thanks, Jake. Sorry. Um, comments? Um, I think the one, the one thing that Jake mentioned was on relating to the business model and uh, trying to find the right context for a particular project that takes place. Um, I think he's used the word networking. I think all of us are going to be challenged over the next um, few years because we're all being, I think we're all being asked to, to um, work with maybe non-traditional contacts. Um, for the government, uh, you know, we have a whole of government approach. And, you know, we know that some, sometimes U.S. government agencies don't always coordinate and communicate as, as well. Um, I know for USDA, we've, just over the past few months, you know, we've, uh, we've had questions from State Department people who are involved in, in child labor initiatives. Uh, we have HIV AIDS initiatives that are out there, as well as ag development. And with the greater investment that's going to be taking place <clears throat> in agricultural development around the world, I think we're going to continue to be um, called upon to work with non-traditional parties. And I think it's those non-traditional parties that may, in fact, be able to help us most by getting us closer to that sustainability. Great. Is there one more burning question? 
No, I'm looking at that <laughs> sector back there. So, Five okay, only, oh, yeah. Okay, yes. Anj. Anj Timbo, Africa. Just a quick question. Jack, you were saying that, uh, and my question is uh, about the, the poultry industry. Generally in Africa, I mean, the poultry, the chicken are sold as a kind of fowl with the two legs. But in this particular case in, uh, in uh, Mozambique, do we have an industry? And then we have the whole thing processed and packaged. And if that's a contest, what is, uh, I mean, each woman with uh, it's a very small industry, what does she take? What does she gain out of it? So that's the first question. The second question is regarding the, the, the maize. You talk about the fortification. I just want to know what type of fortification they use over there to improve uh, the nutritional aspect. Thank you. Thanks, Anj. Quickly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, a lot of the chicken is still sold live. I mean, there's no question about that. I don't have the mix uh, right now between, you know, live and frozen, but a lot of chicken obviously was coming in from Brazil frozen. Uh, so in a sense, we were competing against a frozen market that already existed, uh, and that's where a lot of that market share came from. Um, that doesn't mean that those families are only selling frozen or only selling to, to, uh, to abattoirs, but the expansion of abattoirs has been substantial. I mean, there's no, no question about that. It's been, been quite large all, all throughout the country. Um, so there is a market for frozen, even though there continues to be a market for fresh. Um, in terms of what the women get, um, all of these families make a good amount of money from this. I, I don't have the numbers right with me. I made it in other presentations. I wasn't trying to focus on that here because of the nutrition, but um, it's several times the minimum wage uh, when they get to a reasonable scale, uh, and most of them are at that scale. Some of them fail. You know, there's no question this isn't for everybody. Uh, some people can't do it successfully. Um, it takes a lot of skill. Um, and some people are more skilled at it, have the right motivation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if, if, you know, if they do it well, um, the median is quite high in terms of income. Th these are very privileged, become privileged families uh, within their communities, which can also be an issue in terms of social uh, you know, competition within communities. And, and that's another sort of separate issue. But um, you know, th there is substantial income to be made from this. Was in, what was the last question? Fortification. Fortification. Uh, that's what we're working on. We're really at the stage right now uh, of deciding how to do that. And, you know, it, it's, it's complicated because one of the things our partners at DSM are saying is there are simple ways to provide every micronutrient that, you know, and, and even, you know, other things that, a, that somebody needs that can be even added to sugar you know, and relatively cheaply, and, and that would be sufficient nutrition. And we should take that approach because that's kind of what we do with animals. Uh, instead of, you know, a little bit of vitamin A here and a little bit of iodine there and, you know, and so on and so forth. But is that marketable? You know, can you sell a, a woman on that? You know, one of the reasons that I think we sell vitamins to us as this vitamin and that vitamin and the other vitamin is that we think we want to understand what our vitamin needs are and, you know, and kind of decide and, you know, and, and that actually increases the profitability of the business. Choice increases profitability in business. So there is a bit of a challenge there, and we're working on the business model. Uh, you know, this is still early stages. As I said, we're, we're pulling together the partners and developing the package of goods and services that we think these women maize mill owners uh, should sell. So, um, you know, there's no solution to that yet. Although it's very important, one thing we foresee is we will have regulatory issues in this industry just like we have had with the poultry. You know, and, and one of the issues we will need to do is to fight the big mills, you know, who will want certain kinds of specifications that they know only they can meet, you know, to keep out the small ones. Uh, and we're already anticipating that, and that'll be part of our plan as well, is to say, how can we make sure, you know, that their public good is being protected in some way through the regulations that apply to the small, but that they still have uh, an ability to compete at that small level. Thanks, Ron. Can we come up? Okay, good. Well, I think we need to turn over the space to the, the next panel, and I want to say it's uh, really rewarding to be a moderator when you know it's an important topic, you, it, you learn a lot, and you see so much interest from the audience. So I, I think we'll be back to discuss this um, again. So thank, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>